Welcome to our review on the development of the periodic table. So what we're actually going to do here is have a little look and see how we actually came to get the periodic table that we all know today. And to do this, we've got to go all the way back to the start of the 1800s, first of all. Now, when we go back to the start of the 1800s, scientists were trying to understand the chemical elements, but they had a few problems, let's say. First of all, they didn't really know much about atoms, as we've seen in C1, where we looked at the history of the atom. At the start of the 1800s, their knowledge was a bit rubbish. They also thought some compounds were elements, and they didn't have a complete list of all of the elements. So what we actually found was, during the 1800s, we actually got to a point where elements were being found almost every year. And that meant that as scientists were being presented with more and more of these elements, they were starting to look for patterns in the behaviour of them to allow them to order them in some way. The first scientist you need to remember the name of is someone that we've already met. It's John Dalton again. And what Dalton actually did was he arranged the elements in order of their atomic weights. And what he then did was he gave each element a symbol. So you can see Dalton's version of these symbols and the periodic table below. Now, as you can probably imagine by looking at that, if you're trying to draw chemical formulas using these symbols, it's not exactly easy. There's a lot of weird little lines and dots and everything to remember, which doesn't make it a very user friendly approach. The second scientist we need to know about, it comes around in 1864, which is John Newlands. And he arranged the elements in order of their mass. And he noticed that when he did this, that the properties of every eighth element seemed similar. So what he devised was this thing called the law of octaves. So he put them into these eights, as you can see in the table below. Now, the big problem with Newland's idea was that he assumed that all elements had been found. So where he had some gaps in those octaves, he just filled them in with the elements he already had, even though they weren't actually that similar. And so that meant his table actually only worked up to calcium. The third scientist we need to remember is Dmitry Mendeleev, and he carried out his work in 1869. And by this point, there had actually been around 50 elements that had been identified. So when he came to put his periodic table together, he arranged them in order of atomic weight still, but he also arranged it so a pattern in their properties could be seen. And the key difference here is that when something didn't fit, he didn't just fill it in like Newlands did. He actually left gaps for the elements that just hadn't been discovered yet. And when he was looking at the properties, he also realised that some of them actually didn't fit where they would fall based on their atomic weight. And so he swapped them around. And a good example of this is tellurium and iodine, because their properties suited them better if they went the other way around. So that's what he did. And the really impressive thing that we see about the work that Mendeleev had done is that when these new elements were discovered, they actually had the properties that he predicted they'd have many years before they were known to exist. So where he had those gaps, he said, look, there will be an element that goes here and it's going to have properties of this. And when they were discovered, he was pretty right. If you have a look at the table below, you can see he had his predicted Eka aluminium and then gallium was discovered years later. And you can see the similarities between his predicted properties and the actual properties when we found it. The reason that all the scientists had used atomic weights to order the elements was because at that time, atomic number just wasn't known. So we couldn't put them in order of atomic number because no one knew what it was. In 1913, that changed because Mosley discovered the atomic number was the number of protons in the nucleus. And Mosley's work then proved what Mendeleev had done was exactly right. So those elements he'd flipped because it seemed like their properties fit better the other way around. When we look at their atomic number, it was exactly where they should be. But at this point, the periodic table was still not done. In 1894, we had another scientist called Ramsey who discovered an element called argon. Now, this was an element that kind of took everyone by surprise because no one had expected it to actually exist. And then the next year, he discovered helium. 
By 1898, three more had been discovered, Neon, Krypton and Xenon. And what Ramsey actually suggested to Mendeleev was that these gases that he discovered formed a whole new group that should be placed next to Group 7. And the key reason that these ones hadn't been discovered until then was because if we know anything about the group to the right of Group 7, we know that they are unreactive. So they wouldn't have turned up in other experiments. So no one had the idea that they were there until Ramsey's work. If we consider the modern periodic table, there's a few facts we should remember about it. First one is that elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number. The atomic number tells us the number of protons in the atom. The number of electrons is always the same as the number of protons when we're talking about an atom. The electronic structure is determined by the atomic number because that's the number of electrons. And the electronic structure then tells us the chemical properties because it's all determined by the positioning of the electrons. The last thing I've given you here is a handy little table to remember for four of the key groups that you need to know about. So group one, two, seven and zero, just to give you an idea of how we can use the periodic table to give us some really quick bits of information about them. So on the left hand side of the periodic table, we always have the metals. The right hand side are the non-metals. So one and two are metals, seven and zero non-metals. In terms of the reactivity, group one is very reactive and group seven is very reactive, whereas group two is reactive and group zero is not reactive at all. If we think about their electronic structures, group one always end in a one, they've got one electron in their outer shell. Group two, two electrons in their outer shell, so we'll end in a two. Seven, seven electrons in the outer shell, so ends in a seven. And then group zero, the outer shells are always full. And then if we come on to think about the ions we make, group one always make a plus one ion, group two plus two ions, group seven minus one ions, and group zero don't react, so no ions. Hopefully at the end of this video, you can recall the key scientists who came up with our periodic table and what they contributed to that work. You can also recall a few of those key properties of the different groups from the periodic table and the patterns that we can see from them.